the Corinthians had problems. And, that's that, and, and, and to say the least, that is an understatement. You know, we've been talking about first century Christianity or being a first century Christian in the 21st century world in our morning Bible class. And the Corinthians had problems over and over again. They had problems. In fact, the, the, the lesson or the letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians has a lot of wonderful things in it for us. And these people had divisions. Some of them were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. They had divisions among themselves. There were brothers in there suing each other. They were taking their brothers to court, which is a terrible thing. They had problems with marriage. They had problems with idolatry. In chapter 11, we find out they were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were coming together, and, they, and, and some of them were eating and getting drunk. Some of them, they even had problems with understanding that the body was one. When you get down to 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's trying to get them to understand that there's all these wonderful gifts. Yes, wonderful gifts. And he says, we're all, those gifts were given by one Spirit. One Spirit. And he goes through, finishing up chapter 12, and he says, the, the, the body is composed of an eyes. The body's composed of hands and feet. And he says, everybody can't be an eye. Because if everybody's an eye, where are we going to hear by? Everybody can't be an ear. Because if everybody's an ear, how is the body going to move? The body is, is, is composed of all different talents. And he gets down to the end of chapter 12 and he says, Are all apostles? Are all teachers? Do all have the ability to speak in tongues or perform miraculous gifts? He says, Let me show you a better way. And then we get to one of the, one of the most fat, famous chapters in the Bible, right? 1 Corinthians 13. What's it about? Love. And he goes through the, the, whole, the whole chapter, chapter 10. Oh, that's what it's all about. Of all the things you can do, if it's not seasoned with love, it means nothing. He says, I can give my body to be burned. But if I don't have love, it is nothing. Nothing. Then he gets down to chapter 14. And chapter 14 is really where I want to focus our attention today. Because, you know, we talked about in our class this morning, speaking in tongues. And we were talking about speaking in tongues a little bit, but really what does Paul start off chapter 14 saying about speaking in tongues? Read with me, chapter 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. It says there, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he does speak mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. You know, those people wanted the spiritual gifts. Especially, it seems like they all wanted to speak in tongues. It really seems like when Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians that they all wanted tongues. Why? Tongues are flashy. Tongues are beautiful. When you speak in tongues, you're actually speaking in, 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 in a form that proclaims the fact that you are blessed by God with a gift of the Spirit. I mean, if your gift of the Spirit is, is, is to interpret tongues, well, unless somebody's speaking in that tongue, you, don't, can't, you can't use your gift. Paul says, yes, speaking in tongues is good. Paul says, I want you all to be able to speak in tongues. But what does he say is better? To prophesy. And to prophesy is better. Because when we prophesy, we speak encouragement, exhortation, and comfort to men. You know, typically, and when we talk about prophesying, a lot of times we think about foretell. Right? We think about Old Testament, we think about Isaiah, and we think about the, 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 the wonderful prophecies that Isaiah wrote down. Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of the suffering Christ on the cross and his life. And we think about that and we think about Isaiah specifically mentioning Cyrus. I think I got that right. I think he mentioned Cyrus. But he mentions somebody 300 years in the future, calls him by name, says this man will come. And then we think about all the wonderful prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about 
Christ, not just in Isaiah, that he will come. A lot of times we think about prophecy as foretelling. But there's also another second half to prophecy. Sometimes prophecy means forth telling. When we talk about prophesying as forth telling, we're talking about people who speak the mysteries of God as the oracles of God. And they foretell and they forth tell what God has spoken of to them. That's what Paul is talking about. He says when people come into the assembly, they should be understanding that what you say in such a way as they receive edification and exhortation and comfort. That's what I want to look at for just a little bit, just a few minutes. Think about the fact that edification, when Paul talks about that edification, when we build one another up, when we make other people stronger in who they are. Romans 14, 19 says, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which we may edify one another. Things by which we may build one another up. Make each other stronger in who we are. Because that's part of what we do with each other. We try to make each other stronger in who we are so that we can withstand, right? Withstand the, the, the trials of life, the tempests of, uh, of life, and the, all the terrible things that happen. And we want to build one another up so we can withstand that. In Ephesians 4.29, he says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That what we say when we talk to other people and we edify them and build them up, it's grace to them. It helps them be better than what they were. That's what building people up means. In Ephesians 4.16, Paul says, From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Remember what he said, what we were talking about, 1 Corinthians 12? And he says, the entire body works together as one. He says again in Ephesians, the entire body works together to encourage and help the body to grow. Every bit of who we are contributes to us becoming more. Individually. When I was a child, I ate specific foods to help me to grow big and strong. My mother, did you drink your milk? Drink your milk. Why? Because milk is good for the bones, good for the teeth. My mother, did you eat your vegetables? Why? Because vegetables are good energy food. And when I eat those things, I become better at who I am. I grow strong. I exercise. That's the body, building one another up by who we are amongst ourselves. Building one another up. Now look what else he says. Exhortation. And a lot of times, most of the time, we should look at exhortation and draw from that encouragement is what they're talking about. Being an encouragement one to the other. Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we might, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, have hope. That we might have hope because of the comfort that was written that we find in the Old Testament. Those things that were written in the Old Testament are given to us for understanding and comfort and hope so that we might draw encouragement from those things. Well, I mean, we look in the Old Testament and we see people who, were, who, who, who lied and who cheated and who stealed. Even murderers we find. Even one of the, the most beloved characters of the Old Testament, David. He made some pretty big mistakes. I'm able to look at David and say, David made mistakes. I can make mistakes too and still be loved of God. Still be loved of God. When you turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2.16, it says there, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. God, Jesus has given us good hope and consolation. We have encouragement to be better, to be more than we are. And Philippians 1.7 says, Therefore we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. 
when Paul was trying to get Philemon to take back Onesimus. He says, you know, you are a great man. You are an encouragement to everyone around you. You encourage me, Paul says. You help me become a better person. That's what he's talking about when we talk about exhortation. I mean, Paul was saying, you help me, but really and truly he was exhorting him, wasn't he? Really and truly he was helping him be built up to be better than he was. And that's what we want. We want to build one another up, be better than we are. Remember the, the verses we looked at said what? That when we speak by a prophecy, we edify and exhort and bring comfort to men and not only men but also the church we're the church keep looking down it says comfort doesn't it when it says comfort and 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 comfort can be any address any speech any communication that helps those who are in pain physical pain spiritual pain any kind of Romans 8:18 8, Paul says for I consider that the long sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul is saying this world is terrible. This world has sufferings. And this is coming from a man who's talking to people who are being persecuted. Not just oh I had a bad day I couldn't find my keys. No. He's talking about people who are being arrested and thrown into prison because they're Christians. He's talking about people who are being arrested and, and, and will be arrested and dipped in tar and set in fire for light, fed to animals, torn apart. And he says there, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that we'll have then. That's comfort. That's strong comfort for us. Paul is talking, or Peter is talking about when sometimes, you know, we face physical suffering. You know, sometimes uh, as you get older, your body starts to wear out a little bit. You start facing physical problems. Isn't that true? That's what I've noticed. Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though through some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partaking in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed you may be glad with exceeding joy. You know, our physical sufferings, just, just our physical sufferings, hurt bad enough. But what about when you see other people suffering? What about when you see other people going through their physical sufferings? It hurts. It hurts me when I see other people suffering. And Peter says, you know, don't think it's strange when you go through sufferings because these things are going to happen. What's he saying? I'm giving you a word of comfort. I'm giving you a word of comfort because these things will pass away. They're going to pass away. You know, even facing the fear of death when Paul is talking in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Those who sleep in Jesus. He's, th these people were not even understanding about our death as Christians. And Paul is saying, don't worry about being dead. Because there's better things to come. Even those who have died, when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring them with him. He is speaking words of comfort. You know, it's almost amazing. I mean, you look at these three things that Paul is talking about, the edification, the exhortation, the comfort, and they almost really sound like identical things. They almost sound like they're all three the same. He's just using different words. But as I contemplated this sermon, this idea of what we're talking about, I contemplated a race. You know, Paul talks about races all the time, right? He talks about being strong and, and running the race with assurance and, and running in such a way that you know you're going to make the end and, 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 find, and finish. 
If you're a coach, what do you do with, with your racers? Before the race starts, you say, you know, you can do it. I know you can do it. You've trained right. You're running strong. You've got the right shoes. You know how to come off the blocks quickly. Those things are building somebody up. Getting them happy and, and ready to go. Psyching them up with what we say. And when the race is going on, what does the coach do? You yell. You scream. You holler. Go, 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 go. You got this. Run faster. You can do it. You can run faster. That's what exhortation is all about. Helping them, getting them to understand that they can do it. And even at the finish line. You know, some people win. And you run up and you hug them and you jump up and down and you say, Wonderful! Let's get your medal. You did a great job. I know you hurt right now, but it's okay. The physical pain will pass. And sometimes we lose. And you hold people. And you comfort people. And you say it's okay. You know why? Because there's another race coming. And you can do better. You can be stronger. And those are like the three things that Paul is talking about. The ex edification, the exhortation, and the comfort that he speaks. Now when you talk about this, and you talk about what Paul is, is saying, the prophesy... One of the things that you can't do when you, if, if you plan to edify, exhort, or comfort brethren with words, you can't do it if those words cannot be understood. The whole problem that the Corinthians had where they were desiring a gift that, that could not use in the church. They were desiring, desiring to be special in a, in, in a gift that they weren't unable to share with their brothers and sisters. And Paul is saying, that gift that you want is wonderful, yes. But when we talk to one another, and we understand one another, we can do so much more. Which is why, at the conclusion of the whole matter, right, in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, and 16, Paul says, and this is the conclusion. He says, what's the conclusion then? I pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't even understand what you're saying? You know, tongues are, are, are wonderful, aren't they? If people are out there actually speaking in tongues, great. Paul says, I'd rather speak ten words that can be understood than a thousand words in a tongue that cannot be understood. That's who we are. That's who we are. We're supposed to be speaking encouragement and exhortation and comfort to our brothers and sisters. You know, it makes, since it makes such an impact, since we're supposed to be understood when we speak, and it makes such an impact, I mean, we have to be doubly careful about what we say, don't we? Ecclesiastes 10.12 says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. Proverbs 16.24 says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the bones. Proverbs 25.11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. You know, when we speak words of encouragement and comfort and exhortation, when those words are spoken in a, in a loving heart, you draw strength from those words. You draw pleasure from those words. We all, we, we all understand that. When people are, 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 are speak to us and they're mean to us, do you want to talk to them again? Absolutely not. I don't want to. But I can take words from a friend when they're telling me that something I don't want to hear because they say it with love. They say it with love. Colossians 3.8 says, But now you yourselves are put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. What comes out of our mouth is so important that James, in James 3.6-10 says this, 
and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among its members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile or creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Ought not be so. I've got a little note in my Bible right there. It says, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. Sometimes, never miss an opportunity to shut up. But the words we speak, the comfort that we speak to people, should be of such seasoned with salt that we should, that people should say, you know, when Scott talks to me, I feel better about who I am. When I'm feeling down about being a Christian, when Scott talks to me about it, I feel better about being a Christian. People should say that about us. Because what comes out of our mouth matters. Matters. You know, what we speak, how we speak, when we speak, is also important for one other very, very strong reason. Of all the reasons I've given so far, that when we talk we should be edifying and comforting and exhorting our brothers and sisters. Absolutely. But let me tell you this. Matthew 12, 30, 30, 35 to 37. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the last day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You will not be justified or condemned by my words. You will be justified or condemned by your words. When you stand before the final throne, you will be justified or condemned by what you have said. How much more incentive do you need to, put, to, to, to present words to people that are like apples and bowls of silver? What more justification do you need than to, when you talk to people, to have your speech seasoned with salt? What more incentive do you need than to be able to speak to somebody with understanding and love? That the understanding and love that we give out to people is what was given to us by Christ. That's who we are. We're supposed to be people who speak in a way that can be understood. I speak in a way that can be a blessing to God. 